David Graeber and uh, he's an author, activist and anthropologist and he will be speaking about uh, his Et talk from managerial feudalism to the revolt of the caring class. Please give him a great la round of applause and welcome him to the stage. À la révolte des classes, uh, soignantes. Uh, uh. Hello. Hi. Bonjour. Hi. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I wanted to talk, I've, I've been in a very bad mood this last week uh, owing to the results of the election in the UK and I've been very hard about what happened um, and how to maintain hope. Ah, there we go. Good, good. Uh, I don't usually use visual aids but I actually assembled them. Um, and the thing so what I want to talk about a little bit is what seems to be happening in the world politically that we have results like what just happened in the UK and why um, there is nonetheless reason for hope, uh, which I really think there is. In a way, this is very much a blip. Um, probably the most... There's a strategic lesson to be learned, Mais I think, uh, speaking as someone who's been involved in là -bas. attempts to transform the world, well, at least for the last 20 years since I was involved in the global justice movement, um, I think that there is a real années, de lack of, of strategic understanding, that there's a vast shifts that are happening in the world in terms of central class dynamics that the populist right is taking advantage of and the left is really being caught flat-footed on. So I want to make a case of, of what seems to be going wrong and what we could do about it. First of all, in terms of, of despairing, um, I was very much at the point of despairing. Um, so many people put so much work that I know into trying to turn around the situation. There seemed to be a genuine possibility of a broad social transformation in England and when we got the results, I mean, um, in terre, a kind of sense of shock. Um, but actually, if you Mais look at the breakdown of the vote, si, for example, um, it doesn't look too great for the right in the long run. Um, basically, the younger you are, uh, le, the more determined you are to kick the Tories out. Uh, the, 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 the core Actually, I've quite like this. Uh, uh, the core base of electoral base of the right wing is almost exclusively old. La base and the older you are, the more likely you are to vote conservative. Vieux, which is really, que, uh, really kind of amazing um, plus um, plus because it means that the, the electoral base of, of the base right is literally dying off. A process which uh, they're actually expediting honte. by defunding health care in every way possible. Um, <laughs> And normally you'd say, oh yes, so what, um, as people get older they become more conservative. But there's every reason to think that that's not actually happening this time around. Um, especially because traditionally people who either had been apathetic or had been voted for the left, who eventually end up voting for the right, uh, do so at the point when they get a mortgage or when they get a sort of secure job with room for promotion and therefore feel they have a stake in the system. Well, that's precisely what's not happening to this new generation. So if, if that's the case, the right wing is actually in the long run in real trouble. Um, and to show you just how, how remarkable the situation is, uh, someone put together an electoral map um, of the UK showing une carte what it would look like pour if only people over 65 voted and what it would look like if only people um, under 25 voted. Et Here's the first one, blue is Tory. Um, if only people over 65 voted, I believe there would be um, four or five uh, Labour MPs, um, but otherwise entirely Conservative. Now here's the map if Et only people under 25 voted. Figure, savoir, there would be no Tory MPs at all. <laughs> there might be a few Liberal Dems and, and Welsh candidates and, and Scottish ones. Um, and Et nord, in fact, this is a relatively recent phenomena. Here's, uh, if you look entendu. at the divergence, you know, it really is votes. just the last few years it started Cela to look like that. So something has happened that like, uh, almost all young people ça. coming in are voting not just for the left, but for the radical left. I mean, uh, 
ce qui est remarquable, c'est que les jeunes ne votent pas seulement pour la gauche, mais l'extrême gauche. Il y a deux ou trois ans, ça aurait été impossible. Le problème, in a situation like this, the swing voters are the people from middle-aged people, and for some reason, middle-aged people L'électorat volatile euh, a plus tendance à voter à droite. Pourquoi C'est ce que j'ai essayé de déterminer. Il faut vraiment réfléchir à ce qui s'est passé en termes de relations pour les différentes classes sociales. Et ma conclusion est que la gauche applying an outdated paradigm. Applique euh, les deux parties essayent euh, de rattacher un maximum d'électeurs, mais la gauche n'y arrive pas à cause de ce problème. Voici une statistique clé entre bien, euh, ce que je voulais dire quand on parlait des 99% et des 1% euh, dans le Occupy Wall Street, au milieu des années 1975, There was an understanding euh, that as jusqu'aux années 70, way, uh, productivity increases, on sait que la... wages will go up too. Si la productivité they went up together, this et salaire augmente aussi. 1960, but it goes back to the 40s. Um, C'est une conception qui more productivity goes up. largement aux années 40. De 1975, il y a eu un réel changement de paradigme. Um, la productivité up, augmente, up, comme vous pouvez le voir, alors que les salaires euh, so, stagnent. Alors la question c'est, que cet argent qui est dégagé par le surplus de production, The other point, Bien, il va au, um, which au 1%. Was key to the notion of 99 and 1%, un autre point important pour cette that, was that, um, 99 à propos de ce que les candidats sont d'Amérique, ce qui est un système unusuellement corrompu. Mais aussi ceux qui fondent le système politique, notamment aux États-Unis, qui est un système très, euh, très corrompu, ou euh, um, plus ou moins on peut dire que la corruption est rendue légale. Et comme c'est les mêmes personnes hein, qui font ces contributions aux campagnes politiques, qui sont les personnes qui ont leur fortune, ces gens-là arrivent à transformer euh, leur puissance économique en puissance politique, et inversement. Alors, qui sont ces gens Et euh, quel rapport avec les changements euh, dans la production Eh bien, ce qui est intéressant, j'ai commencé à regarder ce sujet. C'est que la rhétorique que nous utilisons pour décrire euh, les changements de really euh, classe depuis you know, les années 1970 est assez trompeuse. Depuis les années 80, on parle d'économie de service. Et l'image que les gens ont, c'est qu'on est passé d'une... Dans les, il y a des gens euh, et En fait, si vous regardez le nombre de gens dans food, la banque, par exemple, je n'ai pas de breakdown ici, mais ils sont très constants. En fait, j'ai vu des chiffres qui vont jusqu'à 150 ans, qui montrent que c'est pratiquement 15% de la population qui fait ce genre de choses. Ça a été pour plus d'un siècle. Ça n'a pas changé. Même depuis un siècle, on peut dire que ça n'a pas énormément changé. Mais en fait, ça descend. Le nombre de gens qui sont vraiment donnant des services, des haircuts, des choses comme ça, c'est pratiquement le même que ça a toujours été. Ce qui s'est passé, c'est que vous avez eu une grosse hausse de deux areas. Un, c'est d'offrir ce que je pourrais appeler le service de soins. Et je n'inclurais pas l'éducation et la santé, mais en fait, en prenant soin d'autres personnes. Et en quelque sorte ou d'une autre façon. Dans les statistiques, vous devez regarder l'éducation et la santé, parce qu'il n'y a pas une catégorie de soins dans les statistiques économiques. 
On the other hand, you have administration, and the number of people Et who are doing clerical, côté, administrative, and supervisory work has gone up enormously. Um, to some degree, so according to some accounts, it's it's gone up from you know, maybe 20 percent of the population in say UK or America exemple, in 1900 to. 40, 50, 60 percent. I mean, even a majority of workers. Now, the interesting thing about that is that um, huge numbers of those people seem to be convinced they really aren't doing anything. And, and that essentially, if their jobs didn't exist, it would make no difference at all. It's almost as if they were just making up jobs and offices to keep people busy. And this was the theme of my a book I wrote on, on bullshit jobs. Um, and just to describe the genesis of that book, um, essentially, I don't actually myself come from a professional background. Um, so, as a professor, I constantly meet people, um, sort of spouses of, of my colleagues, the sort of people you meet um, when you're socializing with people with professional backgrounds. Um, I keep running into people at parties and saying, well, who work in offices and say, well, you know, I'm an anthropologist, right? I keep asking, well, what do you actually do? I mean, what does a person who is a management consultant you know, actually do all day? And very often they will say, well, not much. Or, or you ask people, you'll say, I'm an anthropologist, what do you do? And they'll say, well, nothing really. And, you know, you think they're just being modest, you know? Um, so you kind of interrogate them. Uh, a few drinks later, they admit that actually they meant that literally. They actually do nothing all day. You know, they sit around and they, they adjust their Facebook profiles. They play computer games. They, some, you know, sometimes they'll take a couple calls a day. Sometimes they'll take a couple calls a week. Sometimes they're just there in case something goes wrong. Um, sometimes they just don't do anything at all. And you know, ask, well, does your supervisor know this? And they say, yeah, no, I often wonder. I think they do. Yeah. Um, so, so, so I began to you know, wonder how off, how many people are there like this? Um, is this is this something uh, some weird coincidence that I just happen to run into people like this all the time? What section of the workforce is actually doing nothing all day? Um, so I wrote a little article. Uh, I had a friend who was starting a radical magazine. Said, "Can you write something provocative? You know, something you'd never be able to get published elsewhere." So I wrote a little piece called "On the Phenomenon of Bullshit Jobs." Where I suggested that, you know, back in the 30s, Keynes wrote this famous essay uh, predicting that by around now uh, we would all be working 15-hour weeks because automation would like get rid of most manual labor. And if you look at the jobs that exist in the 30s, you know that's true. Uh, so I said, well, maybe what's happened is the reason we're not working 15-hour weeks is they just made up bullshit jobs and, and um, just to keep us all working. Uh, and, and I wrote this piece, uh, and you know, it's kind of a joke, right? Um, within thérieux. a week, this thing had been semaine, translated into 15 different languages. It was circulating around the world because the server kept crashing, it was getting millions and millions of hits. Um, I was like, oh my god, you mean it's true? Uh, and eventually someone did a survey, YouGov, I think, and they discovered that of people in the UK, 37% agreed that if their job didn't exist, either it would make no difference whatsoever, or the world might be a slightly better Soit place. Le monde serait... <laughs> I thought about that, like, what must that do to the human soul? Can you imagine that? You know, waking up every morning and, and going to work thinking that you're doing absolutely nothing. If you're, you know, um, no wonder people are, are angry and depressed. And, and, and I thought about it, you know, it explains a lot of social phenomena, that if people are pretending to work all day, and, and you know, it actually really touched me, and it's strange, because bah, I come from a working-class background myself, so you'd think that, you know, oh, great, so lots of people are paid to do nothing all day and get good salaries, like, my heart bleeds, you know? But actually, if you think about it, it's, it's actually a horrible situation, because... You know, as someone who has had a real job knows, um, the very, very worst part of any real job is when you finish the job but you have to keep working because your boss will get mad, you know, you have to pretend to work because it's you know, somebody else's time, it's a very strange metaphysical notion we have in our society that someone else can own your time. Um, you know, so, so, so since you're on the clock you have to keep working or pretend to be, um, make up something to to look busy. 
Well, apparently, at least a third of people in our society, that's all they do. Their entire job là, consists of just looking busy to make somebody else happy. De faire comme si like, that must be horrible. That must, um, so, Ça doit être horrible. And it made a lot of political sense. Why is it that people seem to resent Quoi? teachers or, or auto workers? After the 2008 crash, the people who really had to take a hit were teachers Détester. and auto workers. Um, and there was a lot of people saying, well, these guys are making $25 an hour, you know? Um, right, well, yeah, that's, they're providing useful services, they're making cars. You're American, you're supposed to like cars. You know, cars is what makes you what you are if you're American. How would they resent auto workers? And, and ouais, que, par exemple, I realize that it only makes sense if there's a huge proportion of the population who aren't doing anything, en fait, c'est parce who are totally y a miserable, and, and are basically, basically saying, like, rien. yeah, but... Ah, les autres you get to teach utile. kids, you get to make Pense, stuff, you get to make cars, like, and then you want vacations too? Vrai... That's not fair, you know? Um, it's almost as if the suffering that you, 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 you experience doing nothing all day si is itself rien, a sort of validation of, eh bien, vous n'avez of aucun it's like a kind of hair shirt euh, that makes you ju- uh, justify donc, your, your, your salary. Whereas par, people, uh, les autres, and, 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 and I actually hear people saying this logic all the time, that, well, teachers, you know, I mean, they get to teach teach kids. Um, you don't want people paying too enfants. much. You don't want people who are just interested in money taking care of our kids, do we? Which is odd, because you never hear people say, you never want greedy people, people who are just interested in money Par taking care of our money, so therefore enfin. you shouldn't pay bankers so much. <laughs> Parce que so you think that would be a more serious problem, right? <laughs> Yeah, so there's this idea that if you're doing something that actually serves a purpose, um, somehow that should be enough. <laughs> you shouldn't get a lot of money for it. Um, all right. so, so, as a result of this, um, there is actually an inverse relationship. Yeah. I don't have actual uh, numbers for this, but uh, there's actually an inverse relationship. And, and, and I have seen economic confirmation of this between how socially beneficial your work is, si you know, how obviously your work benefits other people, people, and how much you get paid. I mean, there's a few exceptions, like doctors, which everybody talks about. Generally speaking, the more useful your salaire. work, the less they'll pay you for it. Um, now, now this is obviously a, a big payé. problem already, um, but what, déjà there's every reason problème. to believe that the problem is actually getting worse. And, and one of the fascinating Et things I réalité, discovered when I started looking at the economic s'aggravé. statistics is that um, if you look at jobs that actually are si. useful, and let's again look at caregiving, Regarde remember the, the big sont... growth in jobs over the last 30 years has been in two areas, which are sort of collapsed in the term service, but are really actually totally different. Uh, One is the sort of administrative, clerical, and supervisory work, and the other is the actual caregiving labor, uh, uh, where you're actually helping people in some way. So, education and um, and, and health are the two areas which show up on the statistics. Okay, if you look at these statistics, you discover that productivity in manufacturing, as we all know, is going way up. Uh, productivity in certain other areas, um, wholesale um, business services are going up. However, productivity in education, health, and what's this, other, uh, other services, basically caregiving in general, insofar as you, it shows up on the charts, productivity is actually going down. Oh, why is that? That's really interesting. Um, I mean, uh, we'll, we'll talk in a moment about what productivity actually even means in this context. Um, context. Here's a suggestion Mais as to why. This de, is the growth of physicians on the oui, bottom le, versus the growth of uh, actual medical administrators in the United States since the uh, 1970s. It's a fairly impressive uh, looking graph there. Um, basically, what that, that sort of um, giant mountain there is what I call the bullshit sector. Um, there's absolutely no reason why you'd actually need that many people to administer doctors. And, and, and actually, the 
Et en fait, l'effet d'avoir autant de gens dans cette administration, c'est de rendre les docteurs moins efficaces plutôt que l'inverse. Ça, je sais très bien dans le monde de l'éducation, par exemple. Le, la paperasse, le travail administratif qu'il doit faire augmente avec le nombre de personnes qui travaillent dans l'administration. Ça a beaucoup augmenté, par exemple, dans les années. Mais quelque chose de très similaire s'est passé en Certes, le nombre de professeurs a doublé dans les universités, et le nombre et par euh, 250 à 300%. Vous avez deux fois plus de gens dans l'administration par rapport aux professeurs. Et donc vous pensez que ça veut dire que les profs doivent faire moins d'administratifs. Et bien c'est tout le contraire. Plus en plus du temps, les professeurs sont consacrés à l'administration. Et pourquoi La raison principale est que If you are hired as, you know, vice si pro, executive vice comme, provost or assistant dean or something like that, um, some big shot administrative position at a British or American university, um, well, you, you want to feel like an executive. And they give these guys these giant six-figure salaries, they treat them like they're an executive. So if you're an executive, of course, you have to have a minor army of flunkies of assistants to make yourself feel important. Um, the problem is, They give these guys five or six assistants, but the, then they figure six out six what those five or six assistants, assistants are actually going to do. Décidé, euh, um, um, il faut leur donner quelque which chose à faire. usually turns out to be make up work for Ça me, right? Uh, the professor. Devenir, so suddenly uh, I have to do time allocation study. Suddenly I have to do. Um, en tant que professeur, soudainement, il faut que je, do, je fasse you know, de, de nouvelles choses à Learning outcome assessments where I describe what the difference between the undergraduate and the graduate euh, section of the same course. La différence is entre un programme de licence et un programme de master pour le même cours. Bon, il y a 30 ans, on faisait pas ça. C'est juste pour justifier l'existence de cette montagne administrative. Now. The interesting result of that is that um, this is where this sort of stuff comes in. It's actually the, the numbers are, are there, but it's very, very difficult to interpret. So I had to actually ha get an economist friend to sort of go through all this with me and confirm that what I thought was happening was actually happening. Um, essentially, what's going on is just as manufacturing digitization is being employed, it's much more efficient. Uh, productivity goes up, the number of workers go down. The number of Dans le secteur euh, manuel, les prix sont en train de baisser en manufacturant, mais ça ne fait pas de dents dans les profits parce qu'il y a trop de travailleurs. Donc, so, OK, ça fait all augmenter le, la productivité. Hand, et le caire, c'est l'exact opposé de ce qui se passe. La digitalisation est utilisée comme une excuse pour faire une baisse de la productivité. On a une baisse de productivité parce qu'il fallait bien justifier um, euh, cette armée d'administrateurs. Alors, quand on y pense, You know, in order to translate a qualitative outcome into a form that a computer can even understand, that requires a large amount of human labor. That's why I have to do the learning outcome studies and the time allocation studies. Um, but really, ultimately, that's to justify the existence of this giant um, army of administrators. Et c'est là que rentre en compte, en jeu, euh, toute cette armée euh, d'administrateurs. As a result of that, you need to have Alors, actually more ça, people working in. Or, Those plus de gens travaillant outcome. These are becoming dans ce less secteur more and more pour arriver à la même production puisqu'on est de moins en moins productif. Um, oh yes. uh, this is what the average voilà, company now looks like. Uh, voilà à quoi ressemble une entreprise. More, more and more of your time ends up being spent sort of making the employees happy and giving them an excuse for their existence. This is a breakdown I saw in a report about American office workers where they compared 2015 and 2016 said, you know, only, in 2015 only 46% of their time was spent actually doing their job. Um, that declined by 7% in one year, and a lot of 39%. Et un an plus tard, on um, déjà plus que that's got to be some kind of statistical anomaly, bon, because that were actually true in about a decade vrai, and a half, nobody will be doing any work at all. Ça voudra dire que um, dans à peu près, uh, but it gives you an idea of what's happening. Um, 
Mais bon, ça donne quand même une idée de ce qui se passe. Alors que la productivité baisse et que les gens doivent travailler tout le temps pour satisfaire les frais dans l'administratif. Il y a un resserrement à la fois des profits et des salaires. Ce qui veut bien payer tous ces administratifs. So what do you get? Plus plus well, if you look around the world, where is labor action happening? Alors, si uh, basically, you monde, have teacher strikes all over America. You have teacher les, strikes les in the UK. Euh, de travailleurs. Um, you have ce sont les care professeurs. home workers. I believe in France, exemple, they had nursing home workers. En, First time ever on a strike. Um, nurses strikes all over the world. Basically, caregivers are, des, are at the sort of cutting edge de, non, of des, industrial des action. Et ces gens qui font des actions de grève, ce sont des gens qui produisent. Mais le problème, évidemment, c'est un problème pour la gauche, c'est que les administrateurs sont les ennemis de classe, en fait. Par exemple, en Nouvelle-Zélande, les infirmières ont créé un manifeste disant que le problème, c'est qu'il y a tous ces administrateurs. Non seulement ils prennent tout l'argent, donc on ne peut pas être augmenté, et en plus ils nous donnent tellement de boulot administratif qu'on ne peut pas s'occuper des patients. Il y a en quelque sorte une opposition de classe entre ces deux catégories. Alors le problème pour la gauche, c'est que la plupart du temps, ces gens sont dans le même syndicat, même dans le même parti politique. Kind of had a sense of intuitively for some time that what used to be left-wing parties, essentially the like Clintonite Democrats, the Blairite Party, la gauche est devenue à la Clinton, like Macron, Trudeau, all of these guys, have essentially the head of parties that used to be parties. À la tête de partis autrefois des partis liés euh, aux mouvements euh, syndicaux, aux mouvements de travailleurs, et qui sont maintenant surtout des partis de partis de partis de professionnels managériels. Glisser vers euh, so devenir des partis are, de profession managériale. You know, Ce sont maintenant that, ceux that qui représentent euh, cette montagne uh, géante d'administrateurs. Um, Même une citation uh, d'Obama où il a plus said, ou moins admis uh, ça. You know, il a dit well, « Quand les gens me demandent pourquoi » We don't have a single payer health plan in America. Wouldn't that be simpler? Wouldn't that be more efficient? And he said, you know, well, yeah, I guess it would. But that's kind of the problem. Oui, c'est vrai que c'est plus simple. We have at the moment, like, what is it, two, three million people working for Kaiser Blue Cross Blue Shield, all these insurance companies. What are we going to do with those guys? We have an efficient system. What are we going to do with those guys? We have an efficient system. What are we going to do with those guys? Qu'est-ce qu'on va faire de tous ces gens si on n'a qu'un seul système beaucoup plus efficace En fait, il a admis que c'est une politique explicite de garder le marché de la santé comme ça, parce que c'est moins efficace. Allows them to maintain a bunch of paper workers in in offices doing completely unnecessary work, who are essentially the core base of the Democratic Party. I mean, those guys. Yeah, they don't really care if they shut down auto plants, do they? In fact, they seem to take this. Glee, they say, well, you know, economy is changing, you just got to deal with it. But the moment that Alors those guys in the offices who are doing nothing are threatened, the political parties leave the dash, they get all excited. All right. So, if you look at what happened in England, well, it's pretty clear that, um, if you look at what happened in England, well, it's pretty clear that, um, it's pretty clair que um, clair que the conservatives won because they maneuvered the left into identifying itself with the professional managerial classes. There is a split between the labor union base, which is 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 the labor Distant bureaucrats who know nothing of your lives. Les gens qui ont voté ça, c'était identifié comme ennemis les bureaucrates de Bruxelles, distants et qui ont des impacts sur leur vie. Essentially, 
the Tories Point managed to outmaneuver Labour and guaranteed their victory le was precisely by forcing Labour into an alliance le, with all the people like the Liberal Democrats and the other Remainers, who then used this incredibly complicated constitutional means to try to block Brexit from happening. Très compliqué okay. pour essayer de bloquer um, le Brexit. It, and it was fun to watch at the time on TV. Bon, We're all six, six, six all this, you know, like all these guys in wigs and strange Par people called Black Rod, you know, in, in odd costumes, um, appealing to all sorts of arcane rules in the 16th century. And it was great drama. You know, it was like costume drama comes to life on television. But um, in effect. And, and you know, it seemed like Boris Johnson was just being constantly humiliated. On avait Everything he did didn't Boris work. Était His plans sans cesse he lost every vote he tried. But in fact, what it ended up doing was it forced what was actually a radical party, which represented sort of um, angry passé, youth parti, in, uh, in the UK, into alliance with qui a représenté les jeunes, a, a dû s'allier avec and un parti qui représente les pressions managériales et dont la vision de la démocratie est celle de l'ensemble de règles. Ça, on le voit bien en Amérique aussi, dans la bataille entre Trump et Clinton. Clinton accused of being corrupt because she would do things like, you know, get hundreds of thousands of dollars for speeches from the government by investment firms like Goldman Sachs who obviously aren't paying politicians that kind of money unless they expect to get some kind of influence out of it. Personne and paye un politicien autant d'argent like si on n'espère pas en say, quelque chose yes, en retour. Was perfectly legal. Everything she did was legal. Why are people getting so Les commentateurs upset? disaient oui mais c'était um, c'était légal pourquoi les gens sont si énervés. Et si vous voulez comprendre les dynamiques de classe like England, dans un contre, euh, dans un pays l'Angleterre ou l'Amérique kind of gives the game away. Because cette phrase là qu'il faut comprendre. Professional managerial classes Parce que les gens des professions managériales être les seules personnes en qui pensent que si vous, rendez la, okay. si vous faites de la corruption et que c'est légal, alors c'est OK. C'est tout est sur la, la règle plutôt que sur le contenu. Pour la démocratie, c'est un ensemble de règles et de règlements. Et si vous respectez le règlement, alors ça va. Et ces gens-là, encore une fois, cette montagne administrative, c'est ceux qui pensent soit la démocratie comme ça, et ils sont devenus la base électorale de gens comme Clinton ou Macron. Blair. People like Obama. Um, now, <coughs> and Corbyn was not at all like that. He is this person who had been a complete rebel against his own party for his entire life. But what they did was they maneuvered him into a position where there had been a Brexit vote, which represented you know, substance, the popular will. And he was forced into a situation where he had to like ally with the people who were trying to block it through legalistic regulation, essentially by appeal to endless arcane laws. Um, Thus, identifying his class with the professional managerials. And a lot of my friends who actually were out on doorsteps, you know, they actually seem to think of Boris Johnson as a regular guy. I mean, this guy, his actual name is Ale uh, Boris Alexander de Feffel Johnson. He is an aristocrat going back like 500 years. But they seem to think he was a regular guy, and, and Corbyn, who hadn't even been to college, and, you know, uh, was, was sort of a member of the elite, uh, based almost entirely on that, you know. Um, à cause and if you look at people like Trump and people like jo uh, Johnson, how do they manage to pull off being pop populist in any sense? Well, you know, they're born pareil, to every conceivable type of privilege. Basically, they do it by acting like the fait. exact opposite of the annoying bureaucratic Pourtant, administrator who is your kind of enemy at work. That's the game of images they're playing. You know, so Johnson is clearly totally fake. He fakes disorganization. He's actually a very Johnson organized person, according to people who actually know him. Um, but he's developed this persona of this guy who's all about content over form and is just sort of chaotic and disorganized. And um, so they're being, they're basically play the role of being anti-bureaucrats. And they maneuver the other side of being identified with administration rules and regulations. And well, those guys who basically drive you crazy. Um, the question for the left then is how to break with that. Um, so I have uh, what is it, 15 minutes in order to propose how we can break with that. Yeah. Um, 
it strikes me that that we need to kind of rip up the game and start over. Um, we're, we're in another world economically than we used to be, and um, perhaps the best way to do it is to think about well, when people say their jobs are bullshit. You know, when people say that 37 percent of people who say if my job didn't exist, probably the world would be better off. I'm not actually doing anything. What do they actually mean by that? In almost every case, what they say is, well, it doesn't really benefit anyone. There is a principle that ultimately work is meaningful if it helps people and improves other people's lives. But avoir sens Thus, you know, caring labor, in a sense, has become the paradigm for all forms of labor. And this is very, very interesting because I think that um, to a large degree, the left is really stuck on a notion of production rather than caring. Okay. And, and the reason we have been outmaneuvered in the past has been precisely because of that. I could talk about how this happened. I think really um, a lot of economics is really theological. It's a transposition of, of old religious ideas about creation where human beings are sort of forced to... If you look at the story of Prometheus, the story of the Bible, um, you know, the human condition, our fallen state, it, uh, is one where God is a creator. We tried to usurp his position. So God punishes us by saying, okay, you can create your own lives, but it's going to be miserable and painful. So work is both, is both productive, it's creative, it, but at the same time, it's also supposed to be suffering. You know? um, whereas, so we have an idea of work as productivity. So, I was actually looking at these charts, um, talking about the different productivity of different types of work. Now, I can see Alors, where the productivity of construction comes in. But according to this, you can even measure the productivity of real estate, the productivity of, of agriculture, okay, productivity. I mean, everything is production. What? Productivity of real estate? That doesn't make any sense. You're not producing anything. There's land, uh, sir. Um, every. Our paradigm for value is production. But if you think about it, most work is not productive. Most work is actually about maintaining things. It's about care. Um, if you think, whenever I see, uh, talk to a Marxist theorist, whenever they, and they try to explain value, which is what they always like to do, they always take the example of you know, a teacup. They'll say, well, like, usually they're sitting there with a glass, a bottle, a cup. They say, well, look at this bottle, you know, um, you know it takes, uh, when you, certain um, amount of socially necessary labor time to produce this. Uh, say it takes, you know, this much time, this much uh, resources. They're always talking about production of stuff. But, you know, a, a teacup, um, a bottle, well, you know, you produce a cup once, you wash it like 10,000 times. Most work isn't actually about producing new things, it's about maintaining things. Um, we have a, a warped notion, which really is very gendered, right? Uh, real work is like male craftsmen banging away or some factory worker making a car or something like that. It's almost a paradigm for childbirth, right? Because labor is supposed to be... Um, the word labor is very interesting, right? Because in the Bible, they, they, they curse Adam to work and they curse Eve to have pain of childbirth. And that's called labor. Um, so there's this idea that, you know... Factories are like these black boxes where you're kind of pushing stuff out like babies through a painful process that we don't really understand. Um, and, and that's what work mainly, is mainly consists of. But actually that's not what work mainly consists of. Most work actually consists of taking care of other people. So I, I think that what we need to do is we need to start over. Uh, we need to realize, first of all, Think about the Et working classes, not as producers, chien, but as carers. The working classes are basically people who take care of other people um, and always have chose. been. Actually, psychological studies été. show this really well. La um, that you know, the poorer you are, the better you are at reading other people's emotions le and understanding what they're feeling. That's because um, you know, it's actually the job of people to take care of others. All rich people just don't have to think Parce about what other people are thinking or care. They don't care, Ish, literally. Uh, um, and so I think we need to, A, redefine the working classes uh, as caring classes. But second of all, um, 
we need to move away from a paradigm of production and consumption as being what an economy is about. Because if we're going to save the planet, you know, we really need to move away from productivism. Um, so I, I, I would propose that we just rip up the discipline of economics as it exists and start over. So this is my proposal in this regard. Um, I think that we should take the ideas of production and consumption, throw them away, and substitute for them the idea of care and freedom. Um, think about it, you know? Um, I mean, even if you're making a bridge, right? You make a bridge because, as feminists constantly point out, you know, you're making a bridge because you care that people can get across the river. Uh, um, you know, you make a car because you care that people can get around. So even like production is a, you know, is it one subordinate type of care? What we do is, you know, as human beings, is we take care of each other. But care is actually, and this is, I think, something that we don't often recognize, closely related to the notion of freedom, because um, normally care is defined as answering to other people's needs. Um, and certainly that is an important element in it, but um, you know, it's not just that. Like if you're in a prison, right, they take care of the needs of the prisoners, usually at least, you know, to the point of keeping, giving them basic food, clothing and medical care. You can't really think of a prison as caring for prisoners, right? Um, care is more than that. Um, so why isn't a prison a caregiving institution, uh, whereas something else might be? Um, well, if you think about care, what is the, the, the kind of paradigm for caring relations of a mother and a child, right? Um, a mother takes care of a child, or a parent takes care of a child, uh, so that that child can grow and be healthy and flourish. That's true. But in an immediate ba uh, level, you know, you take care of a child so the child can go and play. That's what children actually do when you're taking care of them. What is play? Play is like action done for its own sake. It's, in a way, the very paradigm of freedom, because free, you know, action done for its own sake is what freedom really consists of. Play and freedom are ultimately the same thing. Um, so a production-consumption paradigm for what an economy is is a guarantee for ultimately destroying the planet and each other. I mean... Even when you talk about degrowth, you know, if you're, if you're working within that paradigm, um, you are essentially doomed. Um, we need to break from, away from that paradigm entirely. Uh, care and freedom, on the other hand, are things you can like increase as much as you like without damaging anything. Um, so we need to think. What are ways that we can need to care for each other that will make each other more free? And who are the people who are providing that care? Um, and and how can they be compensated themselves with greater freedom? And to do that, we need to like actually scrap almost all of, of the discipline of, of economics as it currently exists. Um, we're actually just starting to think about this. I mean, because... Discipline. Economics as it currently exists is based on assumptions of human nature that we now know to be wrong, right? Um, there have been actual empirical tests of the basic sort of fundamental assumptions of the maximizing individual that economic theory is based on. It turns out, you know, they're not true. It tells you something about the role of economics that um, this has had almost no effect on economic teaching whatsoever. Um, they don't really care that it's not true. Uh, but... Um, but one of the things that we have discovered, which is quite interesting, is that um, you know, human beings have actually a psychological need to be cared for, but they have an even greater psychological need to care for others um, or to care for something. If you don't have that, you basically fall apart. That's why old people get lost. You know? um, we don't just care for each other because we need to maintain each other's lives and freedoms, but our own very psychological happiness is based on being able to care for something or, or someone. Um, so what would happen to microeconomics if we started from that? Um, we're doing actually a workshop tomorrow on the Museum of Care, which we're going to um, imagine in uh, Rojava, which is um, in North 
in northeastern Syria, um, where there is a women's revolution going on, as you might have heard. Um, but it's in places like that where they're trying to completely reimagine economics, um, the relation of freedom, aesthetics, um, and, and value. Because at the moment, the, the system of value that we have is set up in such a way that this kind of trap that I've described and the gradual bolshevization of, uh, of employment, you know, we get, where essentially production work has, has become a value unto itself in such a way that we're literally destroying the planet. Um, and in order to actually reimagine a type of economics that wouldn't destroy the planet, we have to start all over again. So I'm going to end on that note. <laughs> David, thank you so much. Merci beaucoup, David. I think it's very interesting to also have some political views now that we mix in all mm -hmm. sorts of technology and, and it goes very good in the, in the theme of Congress. Um, please, if anyone has any questions, line up by the microphones and we'll go for that. Unfortunately, in the beginning, I forgot to mention that you can ask questions over the internet through IRC, Mastodon or, or Twitter. And uh, remember to use the channel Borg and we'll make sure that they get answered. So, please, microphone number one. When you, when you observe the productivity in healthcare going down, mm -hmm. um, do you have an explanation according to neoliberal uh, um, thinking why hospitals, one with more administrators, one with less administrators, uh, don't have a competition outcome that the hospital with less administrators wins? <laughs> yeah. Um well, one of the uh, fascinating things about the whole phenomenon of bolshevization and bullshit jobs is that um, it's exactly what's not supposed to happen under a competitive system. But it's happened across the board in, in every, uh, it, it, equally in the private sector and public sector. Um, that's a long story. But um, one reason seems to be that, and this is why actually I had managerial feudalism in the title, is, is that the system we have all right um is, is essentially not capitalism as it is ordinarily described the idea that, that you know you have a series of small competing firms is basically a fantasy uh, and it's especially if, i mean you know, it's true of restaurants or something like that and um but it's not true of these large institutions and it's not clear that it really could be true of those large institutions they just don't operate on that basis um Essentially, increasingly, profits aren't coming from either manufacturing or from commerce, but from rather redistribution of resources and rent, rent extraction. Um, so that, um, and when you have a rent extraction system, it much more resembles feudalism than capitalism as normally described. Uh, you want to distribute. You know, if, you, if you're taking a large amount of money and redistributing it, well, you want to soak up as much of that as possible uh, in, in the course of doing so. And that seems to be the way the economy increasingly works. I mean, if you look at um, anything from Hollywood to, to the healthcare industry, you know, what you've seen over the last 30 years is the creation of endless intermediary roles, which sort of grab a piece of the pie as it's being distributed downwards. Um, it's... And, I mean, I could go into the whole mechanisms, but essentially, the political and the economic have become so intertwined uh, that you can you can no longer make a distinction uh, between the two. So, so you have a problem, and this is where you go back to the whole thing about the one percent, using wealth, political power to uh, accumulate more wealth, using your wealth to create more political power. Um, you have an extract, an engine of extraction, uh, whereby the spoils are increasingly distributed um, within these very, very large bureaucratic organizations, and that's essentially how our economy works. Great, thank you. I, could, so much. I, I mean, I could talk for an hour about the. Heure, that's, mais that's mais basically it. it you know, you can call it capitalism if you like, um, but it doesn't in any way resemble mais capitalism the way that people like to imagine capitalism would work. Great. Awesome. Questions from the internet, please. 
how to how to best address this caregiver class mm. when the context of the proletariat is no longer low, sorry, no longer given to await the their class the consciousness. Uh, yeah, how to address the caregiver when the proletariat uh, is no longer what? Please repeat the question. Uh, <laughs> how to best address the caregiver class mm -hmm. when the context of the proletariat is no longer given to awake their class consciousness? Given to okay. awake? Sur la personne, <laughs> si on est incapable yeah, de s'adresser uh, um, à la classe prolétarienne. I mean, the question is how do you create a class conscious? La question est comment créer une conscience de classe pour cette classe. Yeah, yeah. Um, classe. Well, that is the question. I mean, ah, uh, first question, of all, you need to actually think about who the, your actual class enemy is. Uh, and I mean, I, I don't mean to be too blunt about it, but, but, but I mean, the problem we have, right. it, why is it people are suspicious of the left? And people like Michael Albert uh, were pointing this out years ago, that one reason that actual pro proletarians um, were very suspicious of traditional socialists in many cases is because their immediate enemy isn't actually, you know, a capitalist who he rarely meets, but the annoying, you know, administrator upstairs. In, um, and, you know, to a large extent, traditional socialism means giving that guy more sens, power rather than less. Uh, le, uh, so I think we need to actually look at what's really going on in a hospital, in a school. And, and you know, I, I, I use hospitals and schools as examples, cool. but they're actually very important ones que, because in, uh, people have shown that in most cities in America now, uh, hospitals and schools are the two largest employers, universities and hospitals. Yeah, you know, essentially, work has been reorganized around um, working on the bodies and minds of other people rather than producing objects. And the class relations in those institutions are not, you know, you can't use traditional Marxist analysis. You need to actually reimagine um, what it would mean. Are we talking about the production of people? If so, what are the class dynamics involved in that? Is production the term at all? Probably not. Why? Um, that's why I say we need to reconstitute the language in which we're using to describe this, because we're essentially using 19th century terminology to discuss 21st century problems. And I, both sides are doing that. Um, the right wing is using like, you know, neoclassical economics, which is basically Victorian. Um, you know, it's, it's trying to solve problems that no longer exist. But the left is using the 19th century Marxist, you know, critique of that, which also doesn't apply. We just need new terms. Thank you. I hope that answered the question from the internet. Microphone number two, please. Microphone number two. Okay, I guess. Um, so uh, the question is basically to what extent can technology help? Mm. And the, um, the subtext here is there's actually a lot of, pro really lots of projects now whose function at some level is to automate management. Mm -hmm. And but to the extent to which that can be molded into kind of removing this class that you're talking about or somehow making it too painful yeah. for them to exist. <laughs> and some of these projects are companies, but some of them are very independent things that have very soft mark ideas, but with tens of millions in funding. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's the interesting thing, that people talk about it all the time. Um, and, and but, but this is where power comes in, right? Um, I mean, why is it that automation, you know, means that if I'm working for UPS, you know, the delivery guy gets like tailorized and downsized and super efficient and, you know, um, to the point where our life becomes a living hell, basically. But somehow the profits that come from that end up hiring like, you know, dozens of flunkies who sit around in offices doing nothing all day. Uh, it's not, you know, uh, I've actually, one of the guys uh, who I... When I started like gathering testimonies, I gathered several hundred testimonies of people with bullshit jobs or people who thought of themselves as having bullshit jobs. And one of the most telling was a guy who was an efficiency expert in a bank. And he's, he estimated that 80% of people who work in banks are unnecessary. Either they do nothing or they could easily be automated away. Um, and, um, but what he said was that, I mean, yeah. it was his job to figure that out. But then he gra gradually realized that he had a bullshit job because every single time he proposed a plan to get rid of them, they'd be shot down. 
you know, et en fait, um, he'd never got a single one through. And the reason why is because if you're an executive uh, in a large corporation, your prestige and power is directly proportional to how many people you have working under you. <laughs> so there's no, there's no way are they going to get rid of flunkies. I mean, that's just going to mean, you know, the, the better they are at it, the less important they'll become in the operation. Uh, so somebody always blocked it. Um, so, so, I mean, this is a basic power question. You can come up with great technological ideas for eliminating people, people all the time. Gens. But, you know, who actually gets eliminated and who doesn't has Mais everything to do with power. Ceux qui vont être great. Ah. Thank you. And last question, please, from microphone number five. Can we maybe have one question, question. from a non-male person? Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> non-male person. Um, Pardon, sorry. Pardon, um, Sorry, I am uh, not choosing Allez. questions based on stuff. We're Je... kind of choosing all around the hall. Okay. Um, please, uh, microphone number five. Um, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I, uh, I heard that you, like, I really liked your um, description of a paradigm or that um, few people are stuck on production and consumption and that you would like to change the paradigm to a paradigm towards more care and freedom, so on, etc. And uh, for me, it kind of sounds a little vague, and uh, that's why I myself think of a basic income as a human right, as the actual mean to break with the current um, yeah, hegemonic macroeconomic paradigm, so to speak, and I was interested in Ah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I, I actually totally support that. I think that um, yeah, one of the major objections that people have to universal basic income is essentially people don't trust people to come up with useful things to do themselves. So either, they think, either they think they'll be lazy, right, and won't do anything, um, or they think if they do do something, it'll be stupid. Like, you know, so so we're going to have millions of people who are trying to create perpetual motion devices or becoming annoying street mimes or bad musicians or bad poets or, you know, so forth and so on. Um, and I think it actually masks an aide. incredible condescending elitism that a lot of people have, which is really the mindset of the professional managerial classes who think that they should be controlling people. Um, because, okay, if you think about the fact that huge percentages, perhaps a third of people, already think that they're doing nothing all day and they're really miserable about it, um, I think that demonstrates quite clearly the why that isn't true. Uh, first of all, the idea that people, like, if given a basic income, won't work. Actually, there are lots of people who are paid, basically, to sit there all day and do nothing, and they're really unhappy. They'd much rather be working. Second of all, um, you know, if 30, 30 to 40% of people already think that their jobs are completely pointless and useless, I mean, how bad could it be? I, like, you know, even if everybody goes off and becomes bad poets, well, at least they'll be a lot happier than they are now. And second of all, you know, one or two of them might really be good poets, you know? Um, if, like, just you know, 0.001% of all the people on basic income who decide to become poets or musicians or, you know, invent like crazy devices actually do, you know, become Miles Davis or Shakespeare or, um, or actually do invent a perpetual motion device. Well, you know, you've got your, you got your money back right there, right? Great. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, that was all the questions that we had time to. Uh, if you have any more questions, please, I'm sure that David will just take a few minutes to answer them if you come up here. Thank you so much, David Graeber, for your talk, and please give him a great round of applause.